At around 9.50 p.m. on Thursday, August 2, 1979, 14-year-old Sarah Hines and her two friends, Kathy and Jackie, were hanging out at a schoolyard near their homes. Sarah was the first to notice two lights hovering low in the sky near some high-tension power lines in a nearby field owned by Ontario Hydro. The girls decided to investigate. As they made their way towards the field, the lights rose up and sped off in different directions. One went north, the other towards the south. Kathy's father, who was looking out a window at home, spotted one of the lights as it moved across the sky. Back at the field, Kathy spotted two arrowhead shaped objects seemingly moving in a backwards direction from the northwest. Suddenly, a black cigar shaped object with white lights around the length of the craft, there also appeared to be a green light at the end, appeared. The object emitted a sound like a generator operating at a low power. Another arrowhead shaped object appeared behind it. This one at an altitude of around, they guessed, 500 feet. Six objects in the span of just a few minutes. At 9.55 p.m., another oval-shaped object arrived on the scene. It seemed to have a sort of green haze around it. Four long, curved legs jutted out from underneath, possibly for landing. Girls guessed that it was about 12 to 15 feet in diameter and 6 feet in height. It had red lights around the bottom and yellow lights around the circumference. This object seemed to be hovering over the senior public school, which was two blocks northwest of Sarah's home. It seemed to set down on the roof. A girl named Jody, who was standing close to the school, decided to approach it. When she approached the wall of the school to get a better look, she felt paralyzed and began to cry. By this time, seven more teenagers were on the school grounds watching, along with some parents from the nearby houses. Parents reported only seeing the arrowhead and cigar-shaped objects. They did not see the oval-shaped object which, according to the kids, lifted off the roof, hovered about 30 feet above it, and then disappeared from sight when its lights went out. The time of its departure was estimated to be around 10.05 p.m. After it left, the teenagers present noted that the sounds of cars and crickets, which had ceased during the event, seemed to suddenly return. That night, Sarah, who usually slept around 4 or 5 hours a night, found herself sleeping for 12 straight hours. The very next night, at around 9.50 p.m., Sarah, Kathy, Jackie, and Sarah's mother, a friend named Bill, and Jackie's brother, were back at the same field east of the school grounds. They were discussing the previous night's events. They suddenly noticed the sounds of life seemed to stop. They could not hear any crickets. Even more unnerving, the regular sound of cars traveling on the busy roadway leading to the Buttonville Airport three miles to the north could not be heard. Within seconds, an oval-shaped object the size of a football field appeared in the night sky at an altitude of about 300 feet. It appeared to be flat, dark, and solid appearing with large checkered patterns and three large fans of 50 feet in diameter beneath the craft. The entire object turned over slowly, rose, and headed south very slowly. At around 10 p.m., Bill and Jackie's brothers spotted three arrowhead-shaped objects at about 500 feet altitude. The objects seemed to explode silently, pieces separating as if a jigsaw puzzle was being broken apart. The object's total size was now doubled by the separation of the pieces. This broken object was now about 200 feet from the intact object. The witnesses did not indicate how the objects departed the area. As everyone stood watching this bizarre show, Sarah wandered away seemingly unnoticed. Talking to investigators, Sarah claimed that she felt an urge to go alone to an empty field north of the hydro field. As if in a trance, she made her way to the spot. There she observed four bright lights hovering about 500 feet above the field. She returned home and, for the second night, she slept another 12 straight hours. After returning home at around 10.30 p.m., Kathy contacted an operator about the events at the school. They put her in touch with the Ontario Provincial Police, who put her in touch with Joe Muscat of the Canadian UFO Research Network. Muscat arranged to interview the witnesses on August 5th. On August 4th, Sarah, Kathy, and Jackie, along with Jackie's father, went to the hydro field again. Jackie's mother, who was 
A few blocks away, walking towards the school, observed an arrowhead-shaped object heading north at about 20 miles an hour at two feet above street level. As she was watching that, the people at the field were watching two arrowhead-shaped objects for two minutes. Then, at an elevation of about 500 feet, the objects all headed eastward, like a flash. As with the previous night, Sarah felt compelled to go back to the field northeast of the hydro field. She noted that all the sounds were drowned out by an eerie silence. As she approached the road, she crossed it without looking, sensing that there would be no cars, despite the fact that, even at night, that road is usually heavily trafficked. There were no cars or people. At around 10.05, she watched an arrow-headed shaped object move off the street to the field where she stood, settling slowly to a height of two or three feet above the foot-high grass. She walked to within two feet of the object. Four shadow-like figures emerged from the interior of the craft and hovered in a semicircle two feet above the ground. The figures were four foot tall, football shaped, one and a half feet wide and less than one inch thick. To her, they somewhat resembled sheets of paper crossed by a horizontal line on the lower section. Sarah watched the sheet like entities float over the ground for about two minutes, then she lost consciousness. When she came to, she found herself inside the craft. She had trouble describing what she was seeing, but she thought it resembled a cell. From inside the craft, she was looking down at the ground. She could see the field and the nearby roadway. She also saw a man in a blue tracksuit taking his dog for an evening walk. She then experienced the memory lapse. When she came back to her senses, she was lying in the grass 15 feet south to where the object had been when she passed out. The UFO and its shadowy occupants were now gone. When she returned home, she estimated that 15 minutes had passed. For the third night, she slept for another 12 hours. When Sarah arrived home that night, her mother noticed that her face was an intensive red-orange color and her pupils were expanded widely. Mother claimed that her pupils remained dilated for the next 12 hours. Sarah herself noticed two pinpricks on her fingers, one on the index finger of her right hand, the other one eight inch wide elongated red scrape containing another pinprick at the base of her thumb. When investigator Joe Muscat arrived the next day, he noticed that her face appeared flush, and Sarah pointed out the strange pinpricks. She went on to detail the previous night's events to Muscat, ending with, I know you won't believe this, but I was on board a UFO. She took Muscat to the area in the field where they all saw a triangular area of depressed grass. Sarah's brother also came along. Muscat noted that the patch had a gray pallor as if the chlorophyll had been drained from it. He took measurements and photographs of the area and of Sarah's pinpricks. His measurements of the patch of grass seemed to match up with the object Sarah described seeing. When he returned to Sarah's house, Muscat dialed up his associates, Harry Takars and Lawrence Fenwick, the co-director of Kuforn. The three headed back to the area where Sarah had woken up their previous night. In the grass was a nickel and a penny. She remembered that she had 11 cents in her pocket that night. A check of the clothes worn the previous night revealed only a nickel. Three days later, on August 8th, after a heavy rain, soil samples and Geiger counter readings were taken of the affected soil. The soil read a count of 1.7, higher than the normal background soil. Granted, the counter was 20 years old. In a later interview with Muscat on August 9th, Sarah claimed that on the afternoon of the 4th, she and some friends had climbed to the top of the school. They had observed a substance that looked like oil in half-square marks. They had also gone up the next day on the 5th and observed that the markings were gone now. Speaking to Kathy, Muscat asked her to describe the arrowhead shaped object that she saw on the second. She claimed that it was silent and it had red mist around it. Inside the mist, the object appeared white and smooth. It hovered and moved up and down slowly. Its edges were sharp. The bottom looked like pipes of a car, she told Muscat. Muscat did a weather check on the nights of the sightings and discovered that it was clear and warm. There were many stars in view and the moon intensity ranged from bright to dull. He noted that there were some clouds on August 2nd and there was a slight breeze moving in from the southeast. Essentially, it lined up with what the witnesses had described. Muscat and his team arranged to have Sarah undergo hypnotic regression in hopes of recovering her lost memories. The sessions were scheduled for October 10th, 18th, and the 24th. A Toronto MD with an interest in the paranormal and a parent skeptic was brought in to perform the hypnosis. 
At the doctor's request, his name was omitted from the final report. In the first session on October 10, Sarah claimed that she was led on foot through the wall of the object. It was brightly lit outside and uniformly throughout the interior of the craft. She noted that it was sharper than regular lighting and it smelled strange. The best comparison she could come up with was that it smelled like chicken. Her hands went through everything she touched, almost as if she were a ghost. However, there was something she could touch that it didn't go through. A cat. On board the craft, wandering around was an ordinary looking cat. She was later told that they had taken it from Earth and they were, quote, growing it, unquote. They had not yet done any tests on it, but they did intend on releasing it eventually. Sarah found this strange that a cat was allowed to roam about freely on a UFO. When asked what the beings looked like, Sarah claimed that they were shadowy and somewhat transparent as she could see right through them. They were long and oval, not unlike an American-shaped football. Four feet tall, somewhat crystalline, each with a different strange color. They spoke telepathically to her. They informed her that they brought her on board to run tests on her to find out what she was made of. They told her that they had been on Earth before and that they would return when she was around 25. Sarah noted that the time on the craft seemed like a year and she had overheard strange buzzing and beeping sounds at times. Sarah also noted that she could see the area from the sky and at one point she was so high up in the air she could see the whole world. The beings also showed her a red planet. It's red and it's there, but it's not, she told the doctor, seemingly alluding to a sort of parallel world, possibly their world. When asked about the sunburn she got, Sarah claimed that it was because of the lights. The bright lights, they've got to stay on. They've got to have light to keep them alive, she told them. She further noted that her hands seemed to be glowing, but she didn't know why. The day following this session, Sarah was confronted by a very strange man dressed in black clothes. Muscat was informed of this encounter on October 12th. More on that later. During the October 18th session, Sarah recalled the examination. An instrument was placed in her mouth and a light was placed on her index finger and her thumb, which painlessly burned holes into her and extracted blood through them. A machine was placed on her head. The beings told her that it was so they could find out what she knew. When she asked the creatures where they were from, she was unable to recall the answer. It was as if there had been a type of mental block placed there that Sarah absolutely could not maneuver. Later, she saw an ordinary English-speaking human. They conversed briefly. He told her that they were running tests on him too. She asked his name, but again, for some reason, she could only recall the first letter, A, apparently to keep them from contacting each other. He looked to be about 43, short, dark hair with some gray, wearing casual clothing. He told Sarah that he was from here and that he was a shop owner. She could not tell if he was Canadian. He claimed that Sarah was already on the object when he arrived and that the beings had intended to release him after she was released. The man was noticeably calm and even informed Sarah that he didn't mind being inside the craft. She also observed him speaking with the beings, but again, she could not recall what was said. Sarah observed numerous plants and computers in the craft. The majority of the computers were in a single room, which Sarah only caught a brief glimpse of. When asked how she got off the UFO, she claimed that they took her out a door, which was just a hole in the wall. I went through a little hole, and then they put me back to sleep, she told the doctor. When asked how they got her to sleep, Sarah merely replied, they told me to go to sleep. When asked if she was scared during the encounter, Sarah claimed that she wasn't frightened. She didn't feel as though they were there to harm her. During the final session on October 24th, she described encountering a strange man. This encounter occurred one day after the very first regression session. She was in her school courtyard at lunchtime with some friends. She noticed that a man, dressed in a black suit, had followed her from the cafeteria to the courtyard. At some point, he approached her and told her that she needed to move away from her friends and come with him. She did. The two moved away to a private area away from onlookers and had a conversation. Sarah claimed that he was tall, skinny, and was wearing funny looking shoes. When asked to describe why she thought they were funny, she could not give a reason, just that she thought they were funny. The man began to ask her a series of questions, including what were the names of her friends. The doctor wanted to know why this strange man was so interested in her friends. 
I think he wanted to kill them, Sarah replied. The man seemed to threaten Sarah, insisting that he was part of a larger network that monitored things and that he wanted to know what exactly happened on board the craft that night. Sarah felt the urge to run, but he informed her that if she were to walk away while he was talking to her, something bad would happen. She thought about calling for help, but according to Sarah, quote, his mind was stronger than mine, unquote. This seems to suggest that this man somehow was inside her head, which of course matches up with numerous other accounts involving men in black. She proceeded to tell him everything she could remember about the experience. She noted that the man seemed pleased and only seemed surprised when she mentioned that she had observed computers. The man informed her that he was aware of the other man she had met on the craft and that he had spoken to him since the abduction. Before leaving, he told her that she was not to reveal anything else regarding the experience, something that she seemingly ignored. At that point, Sarah claims the man just seemed to dematerialize in front of her. He just disappeared. The doctor asked if she thought the man she encountered was human. She replied simply, no. Sarah described that the man was six feet tall and, quote, looked like a dead person, unquote. He had a dull gray toned face, slanted eyes, and he wore a black suit. She could not remember the shape of his lips, but did recall that his grin seemed sinister. He had a very pointy nose and long fingernails on tapering fingers. His feet pointed outward at 90 degrees and his shoes had three to four inch heels. The doctor who regressed Sarah ultimately could not determine either way the validity of her account. He cited Sarah's past behavioral issues, noting a visit to a psychiatrist just a few months prior to the events. He also believed that she had a vivid imagination, noting that she had once claimed to have seen a ghost and had a prior UFO sighting on the night of July 23rd. Interestingly, when the doctor played back the tapes to Sarah, he noted that she seemed genuinely surprised by what she had said on the tapes. Overall, he found her to be a little too nonchalant about the whole affair. Sarah's father also passed away around this time, and he believed that this may have played a part in what happened. The doctor also seemed to doubt that she'd even seen anything that night, forgetting, of course, that there were other witnesses there that corroborated her story. Of course, to Muscat and the other investigators, they had a different take on things. Unlike the doctor, they had actually gone out and done the legwork of speaking to witnesses and gathering samples. Upon reviewing the tapes of the regression and reading the doctor's report, they noticed that many details had been omitted from the report and possibly one part of the tapes had been edited. At least five times during the session, Sarah claimed that she could not remember. They believed that the beings may have subconsciously implanted a type of blocking mechanism as to halt her from revealing things they didn't want known. His written summary also left out the encounter with the man in the courtyard, the cat, the photos he had been shown of Sarah's pinprick fingers, and her mother's testimony regarding her pupils being dilated for 12 hours. Also, Sarah mentioned under hypnosis that she heard buzzing and beeping sounds. For some reason, this aspect of her testimony did not make it onto the tape somehow. Even though Sarah seemed willing to continue with the sessions, the doctor abruptly halted them, citing that he thought the death of Sarah's father which occurred around the time of the October 24th session, was going to be too much for her to handle. Muscat and the others believe that her revelation of a threat by a man in black at the school may have been his real reason for wanting to discontinue the sessions. The fact that he had also omitted any mention of this man in the report seems curious. Had this man in black also paid the good doctor a visit? Had he been warned off going any further with the sessions? In the end, Fenwick, Tukars, and Muscat believe the 1979 abduction of Sarah Hines from a Toronto field was a genuine event. The other man Sarah claims she encountered on board the craft has never come forward to identify himself. Regarding the cat, if the beings did indeed release it back onto Earth as they said they were going to, it's possible that it, or one of its kittens, are roaming around your neighborhood right now.